Welcome today. And so today we're going to take you through our use case with Manila at Paddy Power Betfair. Uh, I'm Stephen Armstrong, Principal Automation Engineer. Marius Palimario, Automation Engineer. Hi, I'm Kapil Arora. I work at NetApp. So I work with this guys, these guys, and uh, as a cloud solutions architect, I help them with implementation of Manila or any questions that they have around Manila. So that's what we do. Yeah. Okay, so a bit about Paddy Power Betfair. So we formed from the merger in 2016. Uh, we have offices all around the world in the UK, Romania, Portugal, Ireland, Malta, Gibraltar, USA, and Australia. Um, we have an engineering blog that we update based on the tech that we're using, and we try to post on it on a regular basis. So this is Bits and Bits, if you want to check it out. Um, the company has over a thousand engineers and we have multiple different products such as exchange, sports books, games and retail. And um, so the, the bit that actually makes us different is the amount of transactions that we do on the platform. So we do around 135 million daily transactions. Uh, we do around 30 billion daily API calls and generally why we're here at the OpenStack Summit, we ha are building a 100K core OpenStack with around two petabytes of storage. So this is what our reference architecture really looks like. Um, we've went over this in some of the other sessions, but as a refresher, we use our global load balancing solution with Ultra DNS at the top. That leads into two uh, tiers of Netscaler. So we have our external SRX firewalls, uh, and then we have our MPX where we do SSL offload in the hardware, coming down into the Citrix Netscaler SDX, which does content switching to each of our microservice applications that live in OpenStack. Um, the way that we bridge these networks is using Nuage Network's uh, VSG device. So that means that the OpenStack bubble, where you have the networking there, can bridge out to external networks. Uh, and then you've just got simple ACL rules that link that all together. At Paddy Power Betfair, we use a leaf spine topology. Um, so we use Arista for that, where we have a series of spine switches that are interleaved with uh, top of rack switches. We have, for each of our compute racks or infrastructure racks, we have uh, two leaf switches sitting top of rack configured in MLAG mode. And then basically the leaf spine topology creates a BGP routing fabric. Um, in terms of the storage, we use pure storage and NetApp, a combination of the two. So NetApp is used for Manila, which we'll take you through in this presentation. And we also use HP OneView to configure the uh, RAID configuration on each uh, of our hypervisors, or KVM hypervisors that we scale out. Uh, New Edge Networks is installed on our, each of the compute nodes. Uh, it's their customized version of Open vSwitch, which is called the VRS, and that controls flow data in and out of the network based on ACL policies. It's a completely mirrored um, active-active data center with dark fiber between the two. So, what we do is we design our applications for failure. We deploy them across two DCs. So if we're doing maintenance, we can take down a data center or a portion of it. Or if we lost a, a data center in terms of uh, failure, the application and customers aren't impacted. And Kipil will now take you on to Manila. So before we get started on the use case and how it is implemented, uh, we wanted to take some time to actually introduce Manila to you guys to talk about what exactly Manila is and what can it offer us in an OpenStack cloud environment. So I'm sure most of you are already aware of Cinder, uh, which is the block storage uh, project in OpenStack. So like Cinder is for block storage, Manila is for file share services within the OpenStack uh, projects. So what can you achieve? with Manila, so basically you can, as a tenant, say that you need an NFS share uh, in your environment, and you can say, I would like this share to be accessible to this and this particular VM or a host, right? So you can have SIFs, NFS, 
HDFS kind of share which um, you can actually provision. And with help of Manila, you actually get this API layer uh, which, you can help, which, which can help you to abstract the underlying uh, storage systems or NFS servers that you have, right? So that's what Manila offers you. Uh, you can also create a similar way, different types of shares, and then the user will come in and create uh, those shares and provide access to the shares. So why do we need Manila? Uh, basically, uh, like any other OpenStack service, you want to abstract different kind of storage backends, for example, in the case of uh, a storage system or different kind of hypervisors, right? And you want to provide a standardized API, right? So you're getting the standardized API, which you can use to provide self-service to your uh, applications. And the other thing is that you can add it to your automation. So if you are provisioning an environment or an application which needs uh, a, f a file share, you can add uh, Manila APIs to it to actually do your provisioning uh, kind of things. And Manila offers a UI, a CLI, like all other OpenStack services, and also a REST API. And underneath the Manila layer, you have different kind of storage drivers, uh, which like we have for NetApp uh, and other storage vendors, and also, for example, for Ceph uh, FS. So, now let's try to understand the concepts, basic concepts that exist in Manila so that we have a better understanding when we actually uh, look at the demo or the life cycle. So in case of Cinder, we have volumes, right? So, but in case of Manila, we have shares. So it's one-to-one -one, uh, kind of, uh, when you think about shares, it's Manila, and when you think about volumes or LUNs, it's uh, Cinder. And what is different in case of Manila is that you need to provide access to this share, which is different from, from the case of Cinder, right? Uh, in Cinder, you attach your block storage to your hypervisor, and then it is exposed to your VM. But in case of Manila, uh, this is network attached storage, right? And the VMs have direct access to, to the storage system. So there's a direct connectivity or a storage connection between your VM and or your host and uh, the uh, OpenStack or the storage system. So you need to provide access rules, which is different compared to block storage. And then comes also a concept of share network. On which share is this particular, on which network is this particular share available, right? So these are three concepts, we have four more. And you can also have security services because it is a network attached storage. You can integrate it with LDAP or Kerberos or Active Directory. You can take snapshots of your shares, right? And sometimes people get confused between backends and drivers. So backend would be, actually any storage system uh, that can actually provision these shares. And a driver would be an implementation from a storage vendor like NetApp uh, or uh, implementation of CephFS or something like that, right? So that's the driver which actually implements the APIs and the backend is actually the storage provider. So these are the basic concepts that exist in Manila. Now if we look at the contributions to this project uh, since it was actually started, so you can see this is a snapshot from Stack Analytics. So I'm just trying to show that there is a lot of work that is already going on. And we have lots of vendors contributing to it. So you can see that NetApp is the leading contributor to this project. Uh, I didn't mention so far that actually NetApp founded this project uh, in the OpenStack community. We started a Manila project. Uh, and we have been doing a lot of uh, work uh, in, uh, in this project. And we have lots of developers doing continuously a lot of development work in this project. All right, so as I mentioned before, if you understand Cinder, uh, the architecture that we have for Manila is also very, very similar. You have a scheduler like any other, uh, any other OpenStack service, and the role of the scheduler is actually to figure out uh, if a request comes in for a share, where to place this request. So that's the job of the scheduler as part of the uh, Cinder uh, sorry, Manila architecture. And that's also the case in case of Cinder. So very similar concept uh, of architecture. And it also has a MySQL or SQL database, which, which, you can, which you use to actually store the information about your shares. So all the shares that are provisioned, all the information about these shares is stored in the SQL database. You, you get lots of requests from the API server. All, all these requests are queued in, in, the, in the RabbitMQ or whatever queue implementation you're using. And then you have different drivers. Right? So for every driver, uh, you have a share, Manila share, API, uh, Manila share process running. And if you have different kinds of drivers, 
you can use all of them together and offer um, abstract the uh, the different uh, kinds of storage backends that you have. So very similar to how Cinder is in architecture. Now many people also get confused as to uh, is Manila sitting in between access to my share? What happens if Manila service goes down? Do I lose access to my share? So it is important to understand that Manila is an orchestrator. So Manila is actually going to help you provision these shares. It is going to help you uh, abstract the underlying layers of different storage systems, but it is actually just doing orchestration. So you can see the red lines in this uh, diagram is the control path. So basically commands or APIs are running between each other and these components are talking to each other, but there's no data access involved in, in this case. The data is actually directly accessed from the client to the storage system. So the client and the storage system talk to each other directly, and the control path is totally separate. So in this case, if a request comes from the Horizon UI uh, for a new share, so the Manila, Manila is actually going to send the request to the driver. Driver is actually going to talk to the storage system, in this case, NetApp ONTAP system, and it is going to provision the share. And then the user is going to create another API or run another API and say, allow access to this particular share. And the driver will actually put these um, rules, access rules, onto the storage system to allow the access. And once that is performed, Manila is out of the picture, kind of, and data is directly uh, accessed between the storage system and the VM. So we have Cinder, we have block storage, we have object storage in Swift. Uh, where does Manila fit in, right? Many people can uh, may ask, okay, why do we need another kind of storage? Uh, why do we need file share service? Where do they fit in? What are the use cases for it? So generally, if you see, uh, Cinder blocks or block storage has more manage, uh, management required to it. And if we look at object storage, you need very, very little management from a storage point of view. And Manila actually sits in between these two. You need less management of this, uh, the file shares or the storage system, but you get more usability. So the user actually can easily access shares and mount shares and do things with the share. So what are the use cases, basically? Big data, so if you want to provision HDFS shares, you, you would not probably want to do uh, using Cinder, right? You can, but maybe Manila can offer you a better solution in this case. Uh, many databases, like uh, especially in case of NetApp, we see lots of Oracle databases running on NFS uh, for us. So that is a use case that many customers who are moving their traditional kind of workloads or enterprise kind of workloads into, um, into the OpenStack Cloud, for example. They can leverage this and still keep their architectures of their application the same way that it was before. Then we have other applications, traditional applications like SAP. So SAP systems, for example, always need a file share to, to store shared files, to show, store binaries. And if we envision that these traditional applications should also run eventually on OpenStack, on, and they are actually already running. For example, we had a talk with SAP as well last year, and they showcased that how they are using Manila in their enterprise applications. So enterprise applications, legacy applications are also uh, important. And then we also get um, you know, this uh, snapshotting, cloning capability, which can plug into your CI CD systems and also help you reduce your build times and the likes. So these are some of the use cases, and now we will actually focus on Paddy Power Betfair's use case, why they actually chose Manila and what kind of applications they are running. On the right-hand side, we also have different CLIs just to give you an idea, okay, what all can you do with Manila? You can create Manila shares, you can delete shares, you can provide access to the shares, you can create snapshots, you can create, uh, list the snapshots, and you can create different types. So like in Cinder, we have different volume types. You can create different share types in Manila using different backends or storage types. So that was kind of an overview of Manila, what Manila can provide you and what we can do with Manila. And now uh, Steven will actually show you the use case that Bet Paddy Power Betfair has. Over to you. Okay, thank you. So our main requirements with Manila are really to uh, provision NFS shares on demand and programmatically control them through the OpenStack APIs. Um, one of the things that we had was we, we have syslog shares 
that were generally created by um, an external storage vendor where a ticket was raised and a spreadsheet was, was filled in to do that. So what we really wanted to do was eradicate that completely from the platform and make it self-service for our developers. Um, our, our use cases were really to allow developers to self-serve and allow them to extend their shares programmatically. Uh, we also needed for active passive applications to be able to replicate shares between data centers. Um, so that's something, a feature that we would really like to, to see built in for multi-region uh, workloads. So if we've got our OpenStack in our first DC and then we need to synchronize data across to the second region in another DC, being able to support that would be good for us. Uh, currently, we have to go down to the NetApp level to do that and use the NetApp APIs. But it would be good in the future to be able to do that at Manila level. So over to Marius. So basically, we had um, our deployment of Manila in OSB7. So you can take us through how we deployed that. So yeah, <clears throat> at the time we have done this setup, uh, OSB7 with Kilo. Uh, Manila was a technology preview, so for the installation we used uh, a script. Uh, in this diagram we can see uh, the installation topology. So we have a cluster data on tap, uh, which is a HA pair, and <clears throat> on top of this we have uh, SVM, and we use the um, management uh, interface and the data for uh, mounting our volumes and uh, all the services are uh, Manila services are running on our um, controller so we have Manila API Manila share and Manila scheduler with OSP 10 uh, would be will be more simple to install Manila because this come um, directly uh, with an overcloud uh, template, so um, we will have a specific heat template for every services, like Manila API, Manila Scheduler, and Manila Share, and um, obviously for the uh, Manila backend, backend and NetApp. And for doing this, uh, you only have to run the uh, overcloud deploy and use the uh, template for, for this. Okay, so in terms of building this into our self-service pipelines, um, we use the notion of 12-factor applications where we keep the, uh, the operating system level completely immutable and disposable. So every single deployment will blow away virtual machines, spin up brand new ones, and then Based on the principle, all data will reside on attached storage, in this instance, Manila. Um, we also have it where we don't keep virtual machines for longer than 30 days on the platform. So if a team hasn't done a redeployment in that time, we will basically get them to trigger it. So all our patching is done at the start of the pipeline process, where we produce a new base image, CentOS 6, CentOS 7, or Windows 2012. R2, if you're feeling lucky. And um, <laughs> generally, that allows us to patch everything and then pr produce those images using Packer, upload them to Glance. So Manila really is going to be used to mount different shares in this, in this process. And teams will use a self-service Ansible YAML file, fill in what share information that they need, and use it to provision NFS shares in the pipeline. So an example of some of the applications that we're currently deploying, and we're quite early in our use cases, so we've been trying this out in some of our, our tooling applications. So Jenkins, as you know, is a file system, so it makes sense to deploy it on NFS and use it for this use case. We also have a use case for ThoughtWorks Go, which we use for our deployment pipelines. Um, we treat all of our tooling the same way as we do customer-facing applications. So they all have a self-service pipeline, basically to deploy it through into test environments and production. Uh, 
For the, the ThoughtWorks Go use case, all of our ThoughtWorks Go agents reside on NFS and then they access it. So when we're doing deployments, it pulls down all the files onto the ThoughtWorks Go agent and then that's shared between the different agents because that speeds up the deployment process. JFrog Artifactory as well has a NFS requirement, so we provision um, Manila shares for that as well. And we also have some of our customer facing applications. This is our seeders uh, that our traders use. So essentially that has uh, XML files that reside on shared storage. So doing something like block storage for that just wouldn't make sense. So this is how it fits into our Ansible self-service inventory file. Uh, we have our VM naming standard, so this specifies that we want two virtual machines per DC. Um, the other thing that we do is we create the flavor and put in the OS image. So the options here are CentOS 6, 7, Windows 2012 R2, if you're doing Windows. And we specify the flavor with the vCPU RAM and disk space. Also here is we, at the bottom with the host aggregates, we essentially, in the line item with the virtual machines, we put the particular host that those virtual machines will land on. This is for disaster recovery purposes. So essentially, if you lose a hypervisor, it only takes down a percentage of that application. So how does Manila fit into this? Also, we have a run list um, that says the application to install in those virtual machines. Then with Manila, we basically specify the NFS share type and the particular volume. So for instance, and mount points. So then once the development teams have specified this self-service file, they check that into to GitLab and then the pipeline's ready to deploy. So the next time that they do a release, they will increment their particular RPM version and then that will trigger off the self-service workflow where get prerequisites will pull down all of the Ansible playbooks that will be used to deploy the applications and any necessary Ansible rules to actually install that app. The second stage, based on the inventory file, it will create a flavor. It will then assemble the host aggregate dynamically based on what hypervisors you're specified there. Uh, the way that this works is we tag each flavor with particular metadata and we also tag the host aggregate with metadata as well. If those two metadata tags match, the Nova extra specs filter will place it on those particular hosts. So we then check capacity against um, the hypervisor and we also check it against the net app to make sure that we have enough capacity to do the deployment because you don't want a broken deployment and to max out the disk. We then create the network. So this creates uh, the zone for that, the microservice application in Nuage and the subnet which is mapped one to one between OpenStack and Nuage. We then launch the virtual machines onto those particular hypervisors that were specified. We tag um, those, those machines with metadata, which says the profile of application that they'll install on it. So at the next stage, when it comes to run Ansible, it will read that metadata tag and then install the particular application based on the metadata. So every step in this is just a playbook in Ansible. So it's modular and can be reused. Then we create the VIP against the, the next scaler. That's also using Ansible modules. And then we do a rolling update. So what we do is we create the Manila share at this point, ready to be mounted to the particular application. We then mount the VMs uh, to the particular Manila share. And then we serve live traffic on the load balancer. So this is the first deployment. And then we test um, the application to make sure it's good. And then we clean up the previous version and promote it to the next stage. So this, is, um, this will go through quality assurance, uh, integration environment, performance testing, and then production. So it just goes through that same pipeline step. So the second deployment comes in. 
we set up the flavor and uh, host aggregate. So if there's been any changes to the spec of the flavor, a brand new one's created, then the new boxes will be created with that new uh, profile. We then check the capacity to make sure that we have enough again. We create the B network. So we have completely immutable networks here. It applies the ACL policies, so we don't do in-place updates. We then launch the new virtual machines for the B deployment. We install the application on it. We create the VIP. Our uh, modules are completely idempotent, meaning that if the state of the VIP hasn't changed, no change will be made. So it just skips that stage. And then we mount the virtual machines to Manila. Obviously, this is different from block storage, so you can mount, have multiple mount points. We then switch over the traffic to the new mount. And then we will test the application. And then we clean up the previous version. And then that will alternate between the two, each deployment. So everything that we do is completely immutable in terms of all the components in OpenStack. The only thing that lives on is the, the Manila share with the data on it. OK. And now we're at the point of Marius. Yeah. So for the automation of, of this, we have some custom Ansible modules that our developer Mario Santos have done. And in this diagram, we can see the flow of um, the automation. So we will have our pipeline that uh, will, cut, will um, run the Ansible modules, then we'll go through the REST API and create um, the module, and then um, provide access to the VM um, for um, the specific share. And now we're going to, can you switch it? Can Live demo. No pressure matters. So, uh, it's not switched. Can you switch the presentation? I think they were sleeping. We're good now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, for this demo, we have an application which is called Boston. And <clears throat> as Stephen said, uh, we have our inventory file, and here inside we have specified our volume, which is a, a NetApp share type 1, NFS share, and like mount point will be Jenkins. So um, for this demo, we chose to deploy um, Jenkins master and um, attach the home um, directory of the Jenkins to this mount point Jenkins. So inside Horizon, we can see that we have our AB deployment and um, our actual um, VM on which um, is running the Jenkins master is the B box. So we're going over the rolling update stage at this point in the pipeline. Here we can see that we have our volume, which is mount on Jenkins. And for proving the persistence of the share, I will create a job which I will call Hello Boston. <laughs> You've got blue balls. Green oh, balls are better. Actually, they're green. Are they green? I'm colorblind anyway, so it doesn't make any difference to me. Now oh, they're green. So I will create another one. Hello, OpenStack. Okay. 
So we are just trying to generate data in, yeah. within Jenkins. So if we go, we go here, Responsibility. We can see our jobs. Mm -hmm. And if I do a Manila list on our controller, we can see our Manila share, which is data test 001. And now I will run um, our rolling update playbook, which will do step-by-step uh, -step the rolling update. Do you want to show the playbook? So here's the playbook. Here is uh, how we create our Manila share. So based on inventory, we, we get all the uh, specification. So that's just pulling it back from that self-service inventory file which I showed you earlier. Then once the share is created, we provide uh, access on this share then we we'll mount the NFS share um, on our VMs. Then we will check the SSH connection before stopping the application on the old boxes. Then we unmount the NFS share from the old boxes. And we change the default uh, config of Jenkins uh, with our mount um, slash Jenkins. We start the application on the new boxes and uh, for the demo pr propose we use a C name. Uh, normally in production we have a load balancer. So based on uh, the C name and the AB deployment we flip the C name and in the end, we are checking that uh, the C name was changed. So now we're just about to run the self-service playbook to show you all those steps in action. Well, Marius types, hold up. I don't blame you for not typing that out. <laughs> Can you see? I, yeah. Okay. Yep. 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 <laughs> Lighting <Virtual> up. Credentials. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been magical otherwise, right? Fingers crossed. So, just to show you, here we have the volume mounted on our B box, and I will SSH on our A deployment. As we can see, we don't have the Jenkins mounted. So we generate the C name. We then create the mount. We provide share access on the mount. We check the SSH 
SSH connection. We stop the application on our old box, which is the B deployment. So this is specific to Jenkins because you can't have two access in the same. Then we unmount the share. Then we change the location to the mount point. We start the application and we flip the C name to the A box. As we can see, we still have the same content mm -hmm. from the same NFS share. Ooh. Awesome. <laughs> OK. Um, can we flip back? OK. So the benefits of using this continuous delivery workflow um, for stuff like Manila, block storage, etc., is we do around a thousand code deployments a day um, on the platform. So every time someone checks in to source control, uh, it triggers a deployment pipeline that goes all the way through to production and generates a re release candidate. This means that we have quite a big churn of virtual machines on the platform. So we spin up around 3,000 virtual machines a day. Um, for test and production, so that's our development teams um, basically innovating on the platform and creating new products that uh, we want to deliver to market. One of the main features of the continuous delivery process is it's lowered our mean time to recover from failure. Um, so each of those pipeline stages that you see is actually linked up to a Slack channel. So if any of the common workflow actions fail, we can basically get a notification and see why it's failed to see whether it's developer issues, where they have filled in the files wrongly, or it's an actual error that we see. And this also gives us a completely traceable deployment lifecycle for applications because we use those ThoughtWorks Go templates. And we deploy applications for all our, of our microservices in, in an identical way. Uh, this means it's completely repeatable as well. And at the moment, the scale of the implementation, we're running just over 644 compute nodes today. So we're serving around 25% of our, our production workloads on OpenStack. We're going to, we're still onboarding in, in the migration phase. So that will increase exponentially. And uh, we're onboarding more and more applications each week. And that will lead us to 100,000 core OpenStack with around two petabytes of storage. And that completes our presentation and demo. And if you have any questions, let us know. We have a, a white paper on our reference architecture. If you want to download it and have a look at what we've done, uh, we set this up because we really wanted to help other users who want to go on a similar journey in terms of continuous delivery and setting up a OpenStack private cloud. And you can see some of the decisions that we've made in there as well. Um, another thing to mention before we get to questions, Nokia have a book signing uh, just after this where they're giving away my book and I have to sign it. It's all very embarrassing. Uh, so you could get a free copy if you come down afterwards. And any questions? I just also wanted to add that this is just, we are getting started on this. And then we also plan to add more features that Manila offers, like replication and share migration, and also add this into this uh, framework that we are developing. Yeah. Uh, just one question on the choice of NetApp. And I realize you're standing in front of a NetApp guy, so you may have some uh, qualms about answering this. But 
Did you consider any other backends other than NetApp for Manila? Um, not really. Um, generally, the storage solutions that we had on the project were already used um, fairly thoroughly. Um, so we used pure storage in NetApp, so we, we didn't look at any others. Uh, the one thing I would say is the driver for Manila was much more mature with NetApp and fully featured than other, others. And then we were just looking to utilize OpenStack to do everything programmatically. So it just made sense plugging in what we, we already had. What type of workloads use Pure versus, let's say, NetApp? Obviously, NetApp, you kind of described, you have uh, been using for creating the file shares in Manila. But what is the other storage that you guys use for what type of workloads? I think the other one is Pure. Yeah, we use pure storage for what type of for block. Uh, so we use it for our databases. But you could also we also use NetApp for our databases. Um, so generally, it's down to the choice of the team what what they use and based on the throughput requirements. Okay, I mean, do you have your, for example, all your VMs on Pure because it does do dupe and maybe you get more amplification? Do you work for Pure? I'm just asking. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> when you create 3,000 VMs, would you want to not dedupe, compress? Makes it easy for you? No, so we, we use our local disk solution on the hypervisors. So as I said before, with 12-factor apps, it's data that will reside on the uh, block storage or the Manila share. So generally, we keep our virtual machines immutable, so it's not deploying it to a centralized storage solution. So the local disk, disk of the operating system doesn't sit on pure storage or NetApp. Okay, you basically have the local boot rather than boot from disk. Yeah. Or boot from LAN. Yeah. Fair enough, okay. No I, I, was only I, I was only joking the about the pure storage. PDI type of load you're trying to imparting on it because that's, that's its strength, so. Cool. All right, thank you. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for thank letting you. us present today. Thank you.